Hey everyone, it's George Carlos and welcome back to a monthly highlight video from the Innovators Mindset Podcast, the first one from January of 2022. It is amazing that you're here today and if you could, I would love for you, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, I'd love for you to like, uh, subscribe if you're not already to uh, done that uh, in this space, but I'm going to, as I introduce these videos, I was thinking about doing something a little bit different. Uh, first thing is I want to ask a question. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Uh, one thing I'm working on right now is really thinking about advice to give to yourself in a first year teaching. So I would love for you, all the educators out there, to comment, what advice would you give to your first year teacher self? And I'm trying to compile some of these stories and it can be like a short comment, um, you know, it's something a little bit longer. But if you're on YouTube, if you're listening somewhere else, pop over to the YouTube channel and just share what advice would you give to your first year teacher self? And for me, um, I, I always think about <clears throat> really how relationships are central to everything and how uh, where you are. The one thing that will really help you is if kids know they're cared for, they'll, they'll look past some of the inexperience that I had as a first year teacher. And that really helped me. But I, 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 instead of telling you a bunch of what I think, I'd love to hear what you think. So comment down below. Um, the story I want to share with you is something that I've been thinking about quite a bit. And before we get into these great guests. I remember I, was, I, I talk a lot about my refing experience, basketball. I think there's so many great things uh, I learned from refing basketball. And I remember distinctly one time I was refing a game and it was, a, it was an evening game. There weren't many people there, but uh, I was getting yelled at by some fans over and over again. And it was so noticeable because there wasn't that many people there, right? And it was kind of discouraging and something you wouldn't put up with any other fast in your life, but somehow we kind of feel that's just regular if you ref basketball. And so it was funny because at halftime, I walked over to these two people that were yelling at me. And I said, hey, I can hear everything that you're saying. And I know that you, you might not agree with some of the calls I'm making, but some of the stuff you're saying is, is kind of uh, rude. And I just want to let you know that just like you're here supporting your kids, my mom and dad are here and they're in the stands and they're hearing everything that you're saying right now. And I just want you to know that I'm, I'm their kid and they're cheering for me and they hear what you're saying to me and they're not really, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit embarrassed because of what you're doing. And I'll tell you, they never <laughs> said a thing the rest of the game. And I think sometimes we forget that every person we interact with is somebody's kid. Somebody is actually cheering that person on. And, you know, we always like, oh, I love kids. And it's like, what, when they turn a certain age, we hate people? Like, <laughs> what happens? And I think I've always tried to th think about that in interactions, not just that I do in person, but online as well, that somebody um, that I might really disagree with, which is okay, you can disagree with people. And I think that's actually crucial to, to growth and development. But, you know, whether it's a parent who's watching their kid or my kids watching me, I always think about that too. And it's something that always kind of resonates with me is when I'm interacting with someone and uh, my friend, Jimmy Cassis, he would, he shares a story uh, about how when he was a principal, he would call the, 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 his teacher's parents and tell about how wonderful job they are. And these are like people that, you know, are in their twenties, thirties, forties and, and beyond. And their parents were so proud. And it's like, we, we always talk about the importance of doing that uh, for our kids. But do we do that for our staff, right? Because there's always somebody cheering you on. And so I just wanted to share that story with you. Because I, I remember that distinctly. And I was just thinking about my mom and missing my dad. And uh, I thought it was something that, um, it, it, it resonated with those, those, those two people in the stands as well. Because I think sometimes we just kind of, you know, we look at the position, not at the person. I think we always got to look at the person first. So just want to share that story with you. Uh, I'd also love those comments about, you know, advice you give to your first year teacher, but uh, any other comments, any of the other things that you, you know, resonate with you from our incredible guests, I'd love to hear from you, but welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Imagine this, if Every single teacher called every single parent at the beginning yep. of the school year and told them good news, told them how excited they were to welcome the students to the class or your student. Um, I know during COVID, just having my uh, child's teacher 
call and say, hey, right. I'm just calling to check on Jocelyn. Like I was practically in tears. You know, that was just a heavy moment anyway, the, the right. pandemic. But if you call and give good news, you call and establish a relationship, you call and share things before uh, there's a moment of escalation or something, then the parent is more apt to believe you because they already have a connection with you. Right. And so um, I think while that is a reality, uh, a lot of times the teacher is always wrong. I think there are some things that we can do to be more proactive and connect yeah. and build a relationship with our with our parents. So I guarantee you somebody's, and this is the way I see this, what you just said, and I think it's so important. Somebody is listening to this and they're going, you know, that's a really great idea, but like, <laughs> I don't have time for this, right? Like I got all this stuff I'm getting ready, blah, blah, blah. And the way that I always see it is, you can take the two minutes now no. mm -hmm. and it's going to save you literally hours later when you have to make a tough one. Right. Or you could, you're, you know, and then it, like, it's always, I always see it as an investment, right? That's mm -hmm. an investment in our kids. It's mm -hmm. and plus like, not like I would rather have, uh, you know, a, a five minute tough phone call that I'm not as stressed out as because I built a relationship with the person right. then an hour long stressful. And then this might go to the superintendent and yes. like all this <laughs> stuff. Right. And it's like, mm -hmm. Oh, like just, just mm -hmm. like, I think that advice is so important, but like mm -hmm. for people listening, it is, it is totally an investment that you will get back. Oh, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And, may, and maybe you'll never, maybe you'll never have a tough phone call. Mm -hmm. And then all you did was make that parent feel good. Mm -hmm. Right. Listen, I'm telling you, it works because even uh, we yeah. uh, it was an initiative of our school district. And just to see, you know, social media, I'm pretty active on pretty much all of the platforms. And so to hear to see parents who are post either a good newsletter or to, right. uh, make a post and say, oh, my God, my, my, my child's teacher just called and told me that he was he was good in class today. That just made my day because normally they're calling to tell me that he's not a good kid or telling me what he did wrong and so on and so forth. So it, parents. You know, I uh, I had a, a superintendent a mentor who told me that parents are sending us the best that they have. It's not like they're keeping all the good kids at home. And, just, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and so um, and they, everybody wants what's best for their kid. It's just yeah. many times they just don't have the tools in order to to advocate for them. And so it's so important that as teachers and, you know, teachers always rise to the occasion. And so uh, that's why we try to make sure that we build those relationships again, not just with our students, but also with our with our families. Obviously, you know, you wrote a book uh, and you share a lot of your learning and you are just doing incredible work right now. But I guarantee that this is something and as you evidence and, you know, your stories that you're sharing that you've learned a lot through this process. So if you go mm. back to your first year of teaching and give yourself advice, what would that be? Oh, if I were to go back and give myself advice as a first year teacher, you know, some of the things that I think about, you know, number one is just the teaching is it's, it's all the things mm -hmm. like, and here's what I mean by that. You know, when I went in as a first year teacher, I remember just so desperately, like I didn't want to screw it up. Right? right. There were so many things that I was technically invested in. Like I need to do this and I need to do this. And my content standards are here and I need to share my lesson plans in here. There were like so many rules with it. But right. one thing I wish I'd been told in my first year is it's not about, or it's not about whether or not it's fun or it's rigorous or it's, you know, personal or professional. It's, it's all the things that's and. So as a teacher, you know, just recognizing that you can have fun and you can have high expectations and right. have this classroom that's rich in teaching and learning. You can be professional and you can have personal relationships with your kids in terms of knowing what they love and, and forming those bonds. You can be about content and also have a love for the, the students in your room. And I think that would be one piece. Another piece of advice that I think about in, in my own head is to be you. And that goes back to what I talked about with the three people that I shared. You know, it doesn't all look the same. And right. so even though you might not look the same as your next door teacher who's been there for 25 years, A, that doesn't mean that you are better or worse. And, and B, like teachers are all going to have different strengths and lean into those strengths and right. let that make a better connection with kids. And the last thing I'd say is this, is that, you know, you got to find the joy, right? Like right. I just wrote this book about how to, you know, thrive through really challenging times, but we have to be realistic about the fact that, mm. um, that teaching is hard and that this is hard work. Working with kids is hard. Working with your colleagues is hard. Sometimes working with your leadership is hard. Right. There are hard parts of our job, but there is also so much joy. And by the way, if there's no joy, 
it's probably not the profession that we need to be in. But for so many of us, there is incredible joy. So find what makes us happy and lean into that and figure out what it is that doesn't make you happy and find some ways to like remove that from, from your work. Because when we are happy, when we are able to bring our whole selves into the classroom, we are able to serve and love and care for and teach our students well. Yeah, I, I think I, I think that those connections between like authenticity that you talk about, which is so important because kids will read through that stuff right away, right? If you're not who Absolutely. you are. Absolutely. I think that there is a, such a powerful connection between that notion of authenticity and joy, right? If I was going about my day being something that I wasn't, uh, that would get to me. I, that would, you know, I think a lot of times when we, you know, kind of act the way that we think it's important that we do. And this is something I always tell when, um, when I talk to, you know, we, we've done work together on speaking mm -hmm. and talking about this is that really just be yourself a bit louder when you're on stage. Don't try to be mm -hmm. what you see someone else being right. Because people yeah. read through that stuff right away. And I, I, it makes me love what I do because it, somebody actually gave me a really good compliment the other day. They said, I've seen you speak and I've seen you do podcasts in the way that you write. It's all the same. Like you're the same person. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah. And you know, that's, it kind of makes me happy because I want to be myself, you know, and, and share some of that learning with me. So, um, I, I just love talking to you, Jill. You, I, I really appreciated kind of getting to know you uh, a lot over the last year and, and watching your leadership journey, but also, um, I just love watching how many people you're influencing right now. Mm. And I, I know that that's going to just actually grow exponentially. And, and then I can say, I knew you really early on, right? Well, I so appreciate that. And one thing that's really resonating um, that you've said in terms of me um, is be you, but be you louder. Yeah. And I think that there are so many of us that have gifts to share and have things to say, yeah. especially our teachers. And we just really need to empower them and give them yeah. the voice to say and share those things. And that's why I love platforms like Twitter and blogging yeah. and all of those things, because you get to do that. Be you, but be yeah. you louder. Uh, you talk about kind of the art of storytelling and why that's really important. And one of the things I've talked about in the innovators mindset is I actually believe storytelling is the fuel for innovation. That when people actually hear stories and they, they connect to those ideas, then that's when they actually start seeing them. I, and one of the things I always tell people is that you're trying to get people to see themselves in the story, right? So like, a lot of times people like will tell stories at a conference and like, yeah, you know, I was climbing a mountain and then my arm got stuck and then I had to cut it off. And you're like, okay, well, that's amazing, but I'm, I'm not cutting my arm off. Right. So <laughs> I, I don't, I don't see myself in that space at all. I don't like, that's a really amazing story, but I don't necessarily see that. Right. Whereas I think yeah. a lot of times, you know, I think that kind of the, the everyday experience is some of the most compelling stories. So like when you look at storytelling and you connect it, how do you see storytelling and innovation uh, connected in the work that you're doing? Yeah, I, uh, there's so much to say in what you said. I'm just gonna stay and give it to the question because the Greek thing sent me somewhere else. Actually, you know, speaking of Europe, I, I, was, I was in Norway uh, once I actually ended up kind of getting lost on the way there, but it was like a public speaking like competition. I mean, it ended up, the, the, this, the, the part of it that was educational ended up being all about storytelling. And mm -hmm. the guy that was there was like this world renowned speaker, Eric Edmeads is like, he's like just talk to you about how, Oh, if you guys actually, you know, you millennials don't get it. You know, he's actually Canadian. Now I think about it, he's Canadian, but he was just like, you know, only this little part of history has even had, you know, written everything. He's like, we've been telling stories for 99.9%. .9%. That was like his whole argument. And I was like, you know, I was like, I'm, I need to fact check this, right? Like, I'm running over here because I'm a millennial. I'm like, let me, let me. I like, I mean, it sounds cool, but I was like, do we know that's the case, right? Like, and so I'm looking. I'm like, yeah, it seems to be pretty valid that you know we've only probably had the ability to tell stories since completely before that. So mm -hmm. overall, I would say that yeah, the, the the that that experience and others kind of really allowed me to understand that once we place ourselves in a story. It's right. kind of like even with, with, with sports, it's like sometimes um, it's hard to explain to someone like the feeling of like what was happening, like as the situation happened. Right. Because it's like it's if, if you don't have an art or an understanding of, of, of storytelling 
I would say similar to what we were talking about with other structures, it might just come up as a jumbled amount of things. But as I kind of learned more in regards to storytelling, I was like, okay, things have like a general structure. Hence, Jordan kind of understanding wow. storytelling and how he played the game. Like, he's like, he played the game for moments. Like, it's like, it's a very cerebral thing, but but it's something I feel like, especially like like we're talking about as as um, as people who are trying to teach or or empower anyone, really looking at the situation from how do we get someone to believe in their own story? And I think it also starts with us believing in our own, owning that story, crafting it, seeing all the the positives and the negatives, and and seeing like the, what overlays both of them, which is still like the soul of that person that just keeps on going. I mean, we're here, right? Like we can go back in our story and be like, man, I hated, you know, this part of my upbringing. It's like, yeah, but I'm like here. And it's just like, yeah, but I hated this. It's like, yeah, but you're here. <laughs> like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, you can't like dominate this whole situation, but, but a great story is able to layer in how it would have, you would have gotten to be this, you know, great or decent person that you are now, even if you're just an everyday person. When you're encouraging teachers take risks, mm -hmm. what, do, what happens when you, if you encourage that, what happens when it doesn't go the way that like some, like the, the concept of risk is that sometimes we don't know what the end point is and it could be not as good as we want. So what, how do you get people to a space where they take some risks, things don't work out, and then they feel in a space that they can actually continue to take risks after that fact. I make sure I work with them um, on that, on the risk and what went wrong. And I try to foster a relationship or a trusting relationship where they can tell me when something went wrong um, or look to me to just talk something through. You know, sometimes people come and talk to you. They don't necessarily need your input or suggestion until they talk it through and they come to their own answers. Mm -hmm. uh, a really good example, we were doing a book club um, among faculty and one of the teachers gave students, you know, you hear all about 20% time and everything. Yep. Um, and it was the empower book that we were, we were doing. And so every Friday she gave her class, that class on that day to work on anything that interested them under her subject. She taught health, anything that interested them under her subject, just to tie it back to the, to the curriculum. And then they'd present on it afterwards. So she had everything from your trifold boards to PowerPoints to a board game, things that kids created um, under these topics. And so I remember distinctly her sitting with me after and she rolled in this cart um, with all these projects and boards and stuff on it and everything. She rolled it and she goes, OK, so I tried this and it was awesome. She said, but I never thought about how I'm going to actually grade it. Right. So she had no way to grade because she had some that went way above board. And then right. she had others that just kind of hit the minimum requirements, but still prove that they learned and they showed their learning. Mm -hmm. So we had to sit down and have a conversation about um, two things. One, how was she going to complete this issue with um, assigning a grade to the students? Because there's got to be a grade assigned and entered yeah. and how those discussions would go with the students. And then we discussed about, Okay, so how do you make it better next time? Because you've got this, you're saying they were engaged. You're saying they were learning. You're saying that they showed you their learning. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what it's all about? So so how do we make that better next time? And by better in this scenario, which is a lot of times what this has to do with, better in this scenario meant her being more comfortable with how she was going to assess what they received for a mark, which is a whole other conversation right. between assessment and grading. Yeah. And that's one actually like what you talked about is one of the reasons I really push on this notion of evidence informed practice, not data driven, data informed. And I think that the terminology, the, the definition of data and evidence is actually very similar, but the perception of it is data is like everything I can like measure easily. Right. Whereas evidence, like I'm sure there is actually incredible evidence of learning and that teacher could provide that evidence through that process. But a lot of times the way we, Actually, I actually believe this is pretty much all the time. The way we assess drives our teaching, not the other way around. And so sometimes we like say, oh, teachers shouldn't teach the test. But then all we talk about is what the test scores are. And like, well, that's why they're teaching the test, because that's all you focus on. And then you have a beginning of the year, you know, call to action about improving test scores. And then you're like, why are teachers teaching the test? And like, because that's all you talk about is the test scores, right? So I think that evidence of learning is is really important. So I appreciate you 
making that connection. And so um, the, the second question I have when we talk about risk taking, I'm really big on A, encouraging people to take risks and, and B, then modeling. And so people can see that as an administrator, as a leader, we take risks ourselves. So like when you think about your practice, because it's it's super easy for a boss to say, take risks, who has no concern <laughs> of losing their job, right? Yeah. Like when you're the boss, like who cares? So as a, as a principal, like how do people know that you're taking risks in the stuff that you're doing that maybe you're trying? I actually have an idea of that based on just stories that you share, but like, is there something that comes to your mind when you, when you talk about that practice? Um, I model just about anything I ask them to do. So if we're like our faculty meetings are different, they're not your typical faculty meetings. We do walking faculty meetings. We have discussions about stuff. And if whatever I ask of them, I always tell them that I go first. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll, I'll do whatever I'm asking of them first. The other way I do that is I'm, I'm usually trying different things. Um, whether it's what I'm trying with communication strategies, newsletters, tech, anything like that. Right. And I will model it with them. So if I want them to try a new piece of tech, I put something together and use something with that tech to either just to um, present it to them or to send something out. Um, when I model and, and, you know, taking risks, right? Failure is part of taking risks. Yep. Um, when I do that or make a mistake, I'm the first one to raise my hand and say, hey, OK, look, so I got to walk this back because I made this mistake um, because I was trying this. So I'm going to I'm going to try something different next time. Um, and do that. So I make sure I make sure modeling is super important um, or or central to how I ask them to do things. I, and I, and I, I so appreciate that. And I think it's actually something that should trickle down in classrooms, right? As well. Mm -hmm. So when I work with administrators, one of the things I say is like, "Hey, there's some things that I'm probably saying today that you're not comfortable with, you're struggling with. You might agree with me, but you 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 don't, you're not necessarily there yet, right?" Go talk to your staff about that. Say like, hey, I saw this guy from Canada. Here's something that was really kind of like I was struggling with, but I need to kind of figure this out. So I'm going to kind of go through that process and 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 talk them through that. Like show that you don't know everything, that you're trying to figure some stuff out, but encourage your staff to do the same thing. Like I, I like if you as a staff member, as a teacher, go in a classroom, you're in my PD session. I encourage staff to say like, hey, if you don't agree with something I'm saying, if you feel uncomfortable, if you want to try something new, talk to your kids and say like, hey, I was just doing this PD day. This is something that's new to me. I'm kind of unsure about it. I want to start maybe trying this because what are you modeling to kids, right? You're really modeling to kids what you're expecting from them. You're expecting them to try things they don't know. If kids walked into their classrooms knowing all the things we're going to teach them, then they don't need to come in. Right. And I think part of that is, do they see you modeling that risk? Do they see you taking that risk yourselves? And uh, one of the things I always say is like risk is risk. I think people can connect it to um, inherent, inherently dangerous things. Right. We're like putting kids at harm. And I'm, that's not, I'm not that's not the risk we're talking about. What, right. How I define risk is moving from a comfortable average in pursuit of an unknown better. I always felt this paranoia as a teacher before I was an administrator that I would be taking part in a process that was inauthentic. Like, oh, they already know what they want to do. And I'm just here right. like to go through the motions so that they can say there was teacher involvement. Like I was a bit of a skeptic. Like, right. you know, just tell me what you want me to do. Like, right. right. Like I, I, I was a team player, but at the same time, like I, right. I felt like there was always like, um, a plan that was mapped out for like the next decade, right? right? right. <laughs> like we were supposed to follow it. And you know, the reality is things change quickly and there are a lot of moving pieces to what's going on at that like level of administration. And a lot of times they really do, you know, and I, I know I did as an administrator, I wanted to hear what the teachers had to say before decisions mm -hmm. were made. And like, sometimes I think that's hard to believe. And like what I have found is on both sides um, and not just in this school district, like in other districts where I've, you know, held different yeah. positions, like people can make a lot of assumptions about what the other side is thinking. And like, it comes down to like relationships and communication. Like so often, you know, if someone walks out of a room, it's like, oh, well, like, you know, people heard that the principal wanted us to go ahead and like come up with a full plan for this. And it's like, oh, I think he was just like bringing that up to, right. you know, see if we had any thoughts, like we were, right. were not expected to like do any work on it. And so I think it's just, it's a reminder to me about the importance of communication and relationships and like, you know, for people on both sides to be open to dialogue, like when there are questions, 
because it's when people like sit and wonder and question right. and right. like they get paranoid and think that you know things aren't positive like that's when um the culture takes a hit and so i'm always like i'm a good listener and i also know when people just need to say something and don't need an opinion right. <laughs> so oh. that's important too <laughs> no, that, that actually like like it, when you talk about that there's a certain amount of trust that has to go in that process right and trust is built over time i remember when i was a principal I would tell my staff straight up, hey, like, I will tell you when there's a decision that I have to make where I, you're, you can tell me your input, but it's not going to matter because that is like, there's outside sources. So like, sometimes it's a district demand that I have to do, right? So I don't want to, I never want to get your input pretending I can actually take it and do something with it. Now you can tell me it. But just, I'm gonna tell you straight up, this is not a, this is a, this is a decision that's made. But if I ask you for input, legitimately, like if I'm asking you for input, I am, I am trying to make a decision together as a community, right? And so I think part of it too is sometimes, sometimes what happens, and I think that's one of the, what, I, I guess part of it was the reason I did that was because I got really frustrated when I would give input to stuff that I knew didn't matter. Okay. You know what I mean? It's like, you don't waste my time. Just tell me that you have to do the thing because I don't want you. I like, there's, I would rather you not listen to me than you pretend to listen to me and then do nothing with what I said. That's right. where I struggle. Right. And I struggle when I see that in schools with kids like, Oh, we empowered student voice. Uh, we didn't do anything based on what they said, but Oh, we let them talk. And it's like, well, don't waste your time. They got other stuff they can be doing. Right. So that's something that's, you know, I think is that's trust. There's trust in that you know, that process.